sharing today's afternoon sessions of the Let's Sit Conference. Today I'm very excited to introduce you our second plenary speaker of today, Professor Ahai Parekh from UC Berkeley. Um, he finished his PhD at MIT Litz in 1992, so he is a Litz alumnus, and he's been making con consistent contribution to Litz even after he left MIT. Uh, he has written many highly influential papers on networks. Uh, for example, one of his papers titled uh, a generalized processor um, sharing approach to flow control in integrated services networks uh, was originally published in 1993 and won the best paper award in at Infocom and the IEEE Communication Society's William Bennett Prize Paper Awards. And then uh, later in 2002, it was selected as one of the 16 most influential papers on networking to appear in the last 50 years. Um, Professor Parekh has spent a l number of years in industry as an entrepreneur and as an, in and as an investor. Uh, he has founded a number of successful startups, um, including uh, Fast Forward Networks, Flowgram, and most recently, Litmus. So, concurrently with his startup activities, he uh, has been an adjunct professor in the ECS department at UC Berkeley since um, 2003. So, Today is going to talk about um, sharing human resources. So please welcome Professor Prak. Thank you. So can everybody hear me? Because I'm not wearing a mic. Is it all good back there? Awesome. So uh, it's. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Sorry. So it's it's a it's a real delight to be here. Um, I was a student a long time ago, and I love lids and. I had a great time here. Uh, what I want to do is uh, actually, I don't know, so I had to, I had to sort of work in the nostalgia a bit somehow. So that'll be a little, there'll be a little bit on that. What I mostly want to talk to you about is, uh, is something that I started working on a few years ago. This is not particularly new work, but it's work that I, I think is kind of interesting because, uh, colleagues of mine at Berkeley, we were all sort of trying to figure out um, how to attack a problem which, you know, which, which typically might be considered to be a soft problem, namely, you know, uh, how do, what's going on with crowdsourcing and how do we, how do we think about uh, human beings as being nodes, computational nodes in the network. And, um, and, and, and we wrote a number of papers on this and so I, I thought it would be cool uh, to talk about it here because one of the things that I actually learned at LIDS was that um, you know you can basically uh, take any of your interests and put some math around it and try to get some some insight out of it. So uh, so that's that's basically what I what I want to do. Uh, there's a you know there's a lot of uh, there's a there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, slides and stuff. So hopefully it won't it won't appear too. If I'm, if I'm going really fast or something, stop me because. Uh, uh, that's totally fine. So anyway, back in the old days, so I, I was a student uh, 30 years ago. Um, some of these guys were, were, were there at the time. <laughs> and uh, Litz was here. So, so this, was, uh, this was very different from the Stata Center. Um, we, um, it, it, uh, we, we built our character over there. Because we we didn't we had sort of noisy heating and um, uh, you know not the best uh, physical uh, plant, uh, but um, uh, you know the more interesting thing is that's me writing my thesis. The the more interesting thing is that it, I actually didn't realize this until I started thinking about this talk. Is that this was really a long time ago. Like we had no laptops, we had no cell phones. You know the internet. Like this is the growth of the number of hosts, and we were there, <laughs> you know. So it was uh, it was a while ago. Um, <laughs> John's already there. No World Wide Web, no anything. Actually, I was at the Coop before I came here, and now you, they even sell a backpack that is connected. Did you see that? Huh? There's, there's late, late 
But LaTeX exists. Yeah. Still. No, me too. <laughs> After LaTeX. It's called T-Rock. Tirov. Oh yeah, I remember Tirov. But anyway, so so that's even yeah, that's a long time ago. So the point is, the point is that because the network was so um, nascent, you know, it had been around. Like the internet had been around for a, a long time. It and but we could sense that there was something really big happening. You know, probably like those of you working in uh, in data science, uh, machine learning, and so on, feel like you know this next century is going to be all about data. So that's kind of how we felt. So it was a wonderful time to work on networking. And the things that we obsessed about, uh, and that I think Lids was, was amazing at, was to think about the allocation of resources, of scarce resources, and to think about networking problems as essentially distributed problems. So, um, you know, the fact that you had a bunch of decision makers as nodes and they had bounded rationality and then you had these, John, remember all that? And then you had um, really complicated resources in the network like bandwidth and so on, which are not like traditional, it's not like sharing a pie or something. And, uh, so we, and, and it, was, it, was, it was great because we, we could tell that there was gonna be something really big happening. Uh, so fast forward, uh, 30 years, 30 pounds, all of that. Uh, and, and around 2015, actually when I was, when I was at Digby Slides, I realized, oh man, the x-axis doesn't even go up to past 2000. So uh, around two, the, uh, you know, I, I was sort of thinking about, okay, so you know, I did a bunch of companies, I was a venture capitalist, all this had happened, Facebook was out there. So, so, we, so I thought, okay, let's write a book on, on network resources. So I, I wrote this, sorry, I wrote this book with, uh, with a great colleague of mine, uh, Jean Laurent called Sharing Network Resources. And, it, and as we were writing it, I realized that a lot of what we were doing was actually about people. You know, so we were looking at utility and uh, <coughs> I don't know, social choice and um, Shapley values and so on, right? And uh, it seemed to me that, you know, the network, well, we were thinking about it very differently in the, in the old days, it was now all about companies trying to reach a lot of eyeballs and then trying to extract uh, money from these eyeballs, right? And so the, the game had sort of changed. It was all about how to get people to do things, how to get them to click on an ad, how to get them to buy a product, etc. And a lot of the really interesting problems seem to be about, about you know, the, the behavior of humans. And um, things were sort of, you know, uh, these are, you know, obviously the companies that, that, that do that, but I actually didn't want to work on that sort of stuff and I was uh, talking to uh, my, my colleague Kanan Ramchandran and we wanted to sort of do something, you know, the, like, you know, work on stuff that is related to some of the, uh, the, the, the one in the middle is Reddit. So, you know, where there's peer production or um, where you use the network to actually disseminate learning on a very large scale. So, you know, at the time, actually, one of my connections with MIT is that I was uh, quite involved in this thing called the Open Courseware um, project, which was way before, you know, all these MOOCs and everything. And it was kind of like a little bit of a sort of a problem child because it was, everyone was putting stuff, but nobody thought it was, I mean, it didn't get a lot of attention. And, and that was the time that I got involved in it and I could see the impact that it had. And then, you know, before you know it, you're at X with a, on a totally different scale. So, so we thought, okay, almost on a lark, like can we do something in this area? Like can we understand what's going on, right? And um, basically, you know, we use this concrete, concrete setting of, of MOOCs where, um, you know, you can basically scale your lectures as much as you want. So that it's not an issue, any number of people. Can, can do that, but um, you know, feedback, grading, another story. Uh, much harder to do that, and unless you can do a good job of actually providing feedback and providing grading, uh, a, a, you know, a good, a good notion of assessment, uh, what's, you know, you, the, you, the value of the degree or whatever credential you offer is not gonna be that strong. And so, um, so we said, okay, what do we do? So one thing that people you know, talk about and that we have in a lot of our classes 
is, is auto grading, where you know the computer automatically, so in a programming assignment, uh, you automatically grade what happens, you know, there's some test cases and so on. Uh, this ends up being fairly limited, uh, even in the case of programming, because it turns out it's quite hard to write a good auto grader. Uh, auto grader is typically quite fragile. And then what about all the other subjects that people want to learn? You know, uh, it, it's, it. So the thought was, okay, this is not gonna you know, cut it. So the other you know, notion is why not make every student a grader? In that case, you know, somebody does an assignment and uh, you know, it goes to all these graders, the graders grade it, you have an aggregation algorithm, and so that's what, what peer grading is all about. But you know, peer grading is, is, is not uh, typically very accurate because you know, some of these students may not be very good graders. And uh, you know, there may be all kinds of issues related to this. So we had some questions, okay. So the first question was, you know, how does the accuracy of peer grading scale with the number of students? That seems like a, you gotta be able to answer that because I mean, you wanna scale the thing. So uh, how does that work? And then, you know, how should students actually grade? Uh, what's up, you know, like if you use grade scope over here or something, I mean, so you have rubrics and so on, but what would be the right way to grade at scale? And then how can we incentivize students to grade truthfully? So we just threw these questions out. We had no idea how to solve them. And uh, fortunately, we had some really good uh, students here who, uh, who uh, took uh, charge of the situation. Uh, so Nihar uh, is now at CMU. He's, uh, I think he's in CS and machine learning. And, uh, and, and Vijay is uh, University of Illinois. And uh, uh, you know, they're the prime uh, folks on this, although we have a number of contributors on, on each of the things that we wrote. Uh, and so it turns out that we were able to use sort of maybe a LIDS-like mathematical approach to tackle uh, every one of these problems. So, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so the first problem. So, um, how can you, so the first problem was, how can you actually aggregate, and, and this work, you know, was, we started doing this a few years ago, so uh, there's like a series of things, you think this was way back in 2014. Uh, but the, the, the question was, okay, so uh, how would you aggregate these grades so that you know, as the number of um, as the number of students scaled, the accuracy could somehow you know uh, go up, right? And um, uh, what what could you possibly do in in in, in that situation? Um, Question. Yeah. Are you assuming that every student has a solution value? Has a what? A solution. Has a, has the actual yeah. solution? Yeah. I mean, what sure. Is the truth? Sure, sure. I mean, you know, is there a ground truth? So for most of this, you know, we have, so yes and no. So yes, they might have a solution, but we have no, I have no way of checking. Because you need so many checkers that for all practical purposes, you don't have the ground truth. So, um, yeah, so, um, damn, I keep doing this. Um, okay, so there are lots of algorithms for trying to aggregate, um, you know, different uh, peer grades, and lots of, you know, sometimes you have like, you know, some experts who go and, you know, grade some fraction of the papers. You have all kinds of permutations and combinations of things that people have thought of, but none of them really provides a, a good guarantee, like the one that we were seeking earlier. Um, what we assumed was that. Uh, every, each exam can you know, be graded by a constant number of students, simply because every student can only grade a constant number of, of things. Otherwise, they'll spend all their time grading, and as the class gets bigger, they'll spend way more time grading. So, so K, each exam is graded by K students. Uh, a constant fraction of the students are imperfect graders, so that takes into account the situation where some uh, graders are actually uh, perfect. Um, and um, the ability of a grader, you know, doesn't have anything to do with how many students there are. Um, okay, and we looked at a sort of a homogeneous population. So the first thing we realized is that it doesn't scale. 
it doesn't scale. So um, if you have D students, uh, and if the average ability is, as we already assumed, is independent of D, then the expected fraction of misgraded students under any peer grading algorithm can be lower bounded by some constant uh, that's independent of the number of students. So, uh, okay. And uh, obviously the constant depends on everything else, like the way you model the ability of the graders and so on. And it holds under a lot of different situations. So, you know, algorithms that are more adaptive. So it's, it's a pretty robust to a number of different ways in which you might think about a peer grading. The intuition is actually pretty, uh, I don't know, it's, 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 it's pretty straightforward. So each uh, exam, as we said, is, uh, is, uh, is, assigned, is graded by K graders. Assume that each one assigns, you know, the grades are binned. So there are some number of grades. Somebody says A, B, C, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, let's assume that there's a, some constant fraction of, of the graders that are imperfect. So, so, so basically, what you're trying to show here is that uh, it's possible for an exam to be shown, to be sent to only bad graders. And then all these bad graders will do the same bad thing. And therefore, you're, it'll be indistinguishable from a, a student. There's no way to really, uh, there's re no way to really distinguish between that uh, kind of uh, a, 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 an assessment from one that was graded uh, properly. Uh, and, and the point is that because you can lower bound it in this fashion, uh, this epsilon is some, some constant, uh, the situation was not going to improve with increasing D. So your hope was that you know, as you increase the number of, of students, somehow you know, this, all this noise in the grading and all the imperfections of the graders will get canceled out and you know, something nice will happen, but it, it's not going to happen. Uh, and and so, uh, so the probability that an exam is graded, say, two bins down by all, all, all K graders uh, is also something that can be lower bounded by something that isn't a, const, uh, a function of D. And so there's just no way you're going to be able to, to, to scale it this way. So then what do you do? So, so I, I'm just a little confused about yeah, yeah. because I'm imagining if you have uh, gamma that graders out of D, yeah. and D is extremely large, yeah. the probability of hitting these random Ds. But, but it's, it's a fraction. So gamma is a, but sorry, gamma is a fraction, sorry. Oh. Yeah, important. Yeah, a fraction gamma. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's a fixed percentage. It's a fixed percentage. Yeah. But and yeah. we thought that was pretty realistic because okay. as you grow it, I mean, yeah, if, if gamma were a constant, then the problem would be yes. different. Okay. But the thing is that it's very unlikely to happen, that you're only going to have like gamma guys who are bad. Um, yeah. So a few years ago, the, maybe you're using this kind of precise model. Okay. Okay. You're assuming some kind of a, a classical crowdsourcing setup, right? Which is sort of the low cost crowdsourcing uh, setting. What's the, the high cost curve? Well, the high cost would be the one where you spend a lot of money to do that. <laughs> okay. uh, no, I mean, here the idea is that you know, you, you have you, your graders come from you know, the pool of students, yeah. and you're trying to scale your class. Yeah, so there's a job students. and there are workers. Yeah. The workers are coming from some distribution. Yeah. Like sort of one parameter. And they're all, they're all homo yeah. I mean, specifically, uh, that would be a student of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, they're, if, they're, if, they're, if they're perfect, they do it correctly. If they're imperfect, then, you know, there's some, with some probability they'll still do it correctly. Like, like very much like David Skeen setup, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so now, uh, you know, what can you do? So you can go back to this idea of auto grading, and you can say, okay, but what if you could like somehow do some pre-processing of the answers, right, and cluster them in some way? So uh, you could cluster them in such a way that um, you could then assume that uh, with with some probability, which turns out to be greater than half, uh, you know, all, all all these guys in a cluster share the same grade, roughly. But you don't, you don't know what it is. So, and then what you do is you, you, you take one uh, representative from each cluster and, uh, and, and you, you get that peer graded. So now instead of grading all the D submissions, you're grading one per cluster. 
Um, then it, it, it turns out that as long as you don't have too many clusters, uh, you're fine. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, the, the reason is that you know, if you can kind of set it up so that the number, of, the, the number in a cluster is growing with D, then effectively uh, each grader is grading uh, you know, at least log D of the, uh, of the submissions. And so uh, you know, we were able to show that this clustering mechanism really doesn't have to be super accurate. Uh, it, 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 all, all these things go through as long as it's reasonably good and, um, and, and, and you're, you're, you're fine. So that was sort of the first thing. So the insight from there was that, yeah, you can, you know, you can do peer grading, but unless you uh, complement that with, with something else, it's not going to be the best solution. So that was the first thing. The second thing was, how should graders grade? So um, basically, you know, that we thought, you know, there's like two ways to grade. There's probably more, but one is, you know, you assign a score to something. So uh, okay, this thing gets something out of 100, and then the other one is you compare. So you give you give the grader two things. You say which one is better, right? So um, so there, uh, I should probably say something about the other other folks on this. So. Um, uh, so Balakrishnan is also at CMU now. He's, he's on the faculty. Uh, Joseph Bradley is at Google. And, we, and, and I'm sorry that I missed one of the, the dot, 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 dot is actually Martin Wayne, right? Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, so there's two ways to do it. And um, when, you, when you do it you know, in, with, with assigning a score, there's a lot of information that you provide with your grade, right? Because there's out of 100, there's, there's some, you know, there's, there, it's a fine grain thing. But the advantage of the comparing is that perhaps, you know, it requires less human effort. Um, and so, you know, what should we do with these peer grading folks? Should they score or should they compare? So this was an, another, another question. And um, basically, the, uh, you know, one argument could be that there's sort of a data processing inequality that holds which is that I can always derive the ordinal rankings from the cardinal ones. And so uh, what's the problem? Like, why wouldn't you just have people assign scores? And from that, I can, I can say what's happening between any two pairs. Uh, so why bother with pairwise comparisons? You could just use cardinal stuff. Um, so we actually, and this was a, a hallmark of a lot of the things that we did, is we did a bunch of experiments. So um, we did a bunch of experiments on <coughs> Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk, and um, uh, we, 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 we gathered a lot of data, which, which, which I think was, was a great exercise for, for all of us. Um, and what we realized that, in fact, if you look at the um, error, uh, you give the same task, an ordinal version and a cardinal version, in many tasks, the um, ordinal stuff is more accurate and it takes less time. So um, it seemed that you know, the evaluators were using a different uh, sort of process for looking at cardinal and ordinal um, evaluation. So it wasn't, you know, there wasn't, it, it, was, it wasn't exactly, uh, so this, the, it wasn't exactly as the uh, sort of the naive reasoning of, uh, of, of, of a data processing inequality uh, would, would, would hold, it seemed like there was something very different in the way in which these uh, the minds were working. Um, so, you know, the question was, okay, so if we're gonna do pairwise comparisons, then uh, how do we do them and how accurate will that be? And uh, so here's, here's, a, a, here's how we, we modeled it. So you have you know, D items, and these could be your D assignments. And um, you have a bunch of, um, so that's supposed to represent the, the D things, the pictures. And then you get, you get these uh, comparisons uh, like this. You send them to different evaluators, and you get one bit answers from each one of them. I like this over this, or that over that, or whatever. 
But there's some inherent value in each of these D items. Uh, and um, so these WI stars. And so these WI stars are, are fixed. They're, they're, uh, and, and what you want to do is you want to estimate it. And in particular, you want to try to figure out how well you can estimate it. So, um, so what model are you going to use? Where's the noise going to come from? So, because the WIs are sort of, the, uh, they're all fixed. So there's, so th th there's um, a bunch of models in the literature that basically come from psychometrics, but then were rediscovered by economists, and a lot of people uh, in the field use them. So one is the, the Thurnstone model, uh, and basically, you know, this is, this is uh, this, the idea behind that is that you have, um, the evaluator has a utility for each of those things, but that's somehow obscured by noise. And the noise is, uh, you know, distributed in a Gaussian way, and so, uh, you know, if, they, if they're presented with two things and they have to choose one, then they just pick the one with the larger utility, and, and that, that's why you have that, that sign, that expression over there. This is what was used, um, you know, for those of you who are chess players, this is what uh, was the ELO system usually, uh, was, was originally based on this. And then there's a kind of a similar model called the uh, BTL model, where uh, the noise is distributed a little bit differently. So rather than being distributed in a Gaussian way, it, it follows something called a Gumbel distribution. And this is what it, this is sort of the probability that you would pick I over J, looks like this, kind of a sigmoid. And um, so, uh, and, that, and that's how, you know, and then this is what the current um, ELO system actually looks like. Um, so we, we assume that, you know, these models hold. What these models have in common is that uh, the probability just depends on the difference between WI and WJ. So our results hold for any model in which uh, we just where the function just depends on the difference. Um, so, so those are the models, okay? And so now what you want to do is you want to try to figure out, uh, you know, supposing you had a certain given number of observations, uh, what kind of error guarantees could you could you give? Um, how many samples should you uh, should you have? So how many how many how many uh, grades, how many graders and how many different uh, times should you get things graded uh, to meet a given error guarantee? And then, you know, uh, this is something that we really put a lot of attention on, which is, you know, like, who do you actually uh, assign these comparisons to? Because there's many different ways you can do this. Uh, what is the best, and I'll explain that in a second, what is the best comparison topology uh, and, and which pairs to compare. So, so um, there's like a ton of stuff on this. People have been working on this pairwise comparison stuff literally forever. There are uh, models, some of which you may be familiar with. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of work from, I mean, from David Roth and colleagues, et cetera, in this, in this area. Um, he just mentioned David and uh, David and Skeen, uh, but you know, the, the, our work was very much focused on on how you assign the comparisons, because our intuition was that these bounds will really depend how how well your estimator <coughs> is and how how well you can actually do will really depend on how you assign the comparisons to people. So uh, you know, other work. Uh, we assume that maybe they were assigned randomly or so on. So, so we wanted to actually look at a different topology. So what does this mean? So supposing you have you know, these set of comparisons, then each of the D items can become a node in a graph, and then you can, you know, you can basically, the two over there means that those things were compared two times. That's it. And then you can divide by the total number of comparisons. We call this the comparison graph. And uh, what ends up being important about the comparison graph is the Laplacian of that graph. So, um, so we really wanted to have our bounds depend on this stuff because we thought it was fundamental. And it turned out to be the right thing. So for those of you who maybe haven't seen this before or whatever, uh, so, so this is the Laplacian of the, from the, compar of the comparison graph. Uh, and um, 
The Laplacian induces a norm, so it's a semi-norm, but basically a norm. Uh, and and uh, the, this is kind of the natural norm in which to, uh, turns out, in which to compare how well something is doing. Uh, but um, as you will see, our bounds were also expressed in the L2 norm. So um, the other thing that ends up being really important uh, in the bounds is the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian. This, this, this thing shows up uh, frequently and is related, it's called the algebraic connectivity of, of a graph. And uh, you know, if it's zero, then the graph is disconnected. It has a, a relationship to, to the sparsity of the graph in general. So, um, so okay, so, um, so, so these are so the so we looked at the loss functions for our estimators. So, so the problem is, you know, we assume that we have this BTL or Thurston type uh, model for the grader. The Ws are fixed, you know, and uh, so we need a loss function for how the estimator would do. So we we had the Laplacian, and then also the uh, the standard um, uh, mean square distance, and then. Um, and then the, the natural thing to look at here is the minimax error. So basically the idea is that you have no idea, you actually don't know what these wi stars are gonna be. Because it's, it's not like a Bayesian thing, it's not, it's not drawn from anything. So you don't know what it's gonna be. So you wanna find the best estimator for the worst uh, choice of the wi stars. So that's, that's what you're, you're trying to do. Um, and um, so, so that, that's, that's uh, the assumptions that we had to make here. Uh, first of all, you sort of, you know what the noise is. So you, you have some way of measuring that. Uh, and then the, the second one is just a, a technicality. The third one is interesting. It sort of says that these WIs are bounded somehow, you know, because uh, we, we show that if they're not bounded, then, you know, you, the, the, your errors, we can't really find any bounds. You can have an arbitrarily bad minimax situation. Uh, the graph has to be connected, because uh, if it isn't, then uh, you know, there's no way to really estimate the, uh, the WS star as well. So under those assumptions, we, um, we, showed, we, we showed these bounds, and, and they're, they're pretty tight. So these constants, you know, they, they depend on the upper bound of the, uh, on, on the WIs, they depend on the noise, and um, they're they're quite sharp. This is this is in the um, in the L semi norm, um, and so what it says is that if you roughly is you know if you if you want epsilon error here, then you need d over epsilon samples. Um, but for the L two norm, you can see that what happens is that the uh, second smallest eigenvalue shows up of the of the Laplacian, and so. Um, so that, 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 that's kind of uh, cool because it, it, it shows that you know, uh, a really sharp upper bound on this uh, does depend on the, on the topology that you have. And the um, question is, okay, so what is the best comparison topology? Uh, all these guys on the top uh, are, are good from the standpoint of the, the scaling of the error. Um, but if you wanted to pick one, you'd probably pick one with the fewest edges. So you'd rather pick the expander over, say, the complete graph. Um, and then these other guys are suboptimal. So, so, so what this tells you is that if you wanted to do pairwise comparisons, what you probably should do is think about how you're going to assign them, and then assign them based on uh, one of these type of topologies. Uh, and, uh, and so you know, we were able to answer a bunch, of the, a bunch of things that you know, we had posed before. So we, we got sort of uh, lower and upper bounds uh, on, 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 um, on the estimators. Uh, we figured out you know, what the error guarantees would be, how many samples we would need, and how we should do the assignment of the pairs. So, uh, so that was a question that we just sort of asked out of the blue, and we got a bunch of answers that were uh, quite satisfying. Um, and then, you know, on the question of whether to compare or to score, 
uh, we had to set up sort of a level playing field of a cardinal versus ordinal type of assignment. And uh, when you do that, you, um, we have an expression for you know, when you should do cardinal and when you should do ordinal. Uh, there's a little bit of a gap in, the middle, in there. Uh, but, but it could actually, I mean, the gap is not that huge. And um, if you could measure the noise, then you could actually use our results to, to, to guess whether, to, to determine whether you should, uh, this task should be assessed in an ordinal fashion or a cardinal fashion. So that was also uh, quite nice. So that, that completes the second question we have. Are there any questions on this? Yeah. So how does this relate to the first uh, question? The first question you have log d. Uh, yeah. We uh, graded, but each grader grades log d things. This that, that's in the, in the clustering setup. But in this setup, each grader grades only one grader? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, you can think about it in a modular way. So, so in the, in the conclusion of the first part was that you order grade, and then you peer grade. Right? So this is just looking, so now the D changes to the number of peer graded things. I see. Yeah, and so this is just how you would, how you would actually uh, do the peer grading if you, had, if you had D things, you know, to grade. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so wait, so I think I, we covered this. Okay, so, um, so that, that takes me to the third problem that we uh, were curious about, which is uh, how to incentivize the graders. So how to make sure that they actually tell the truth. Um, I think that we have a, a, sort of a cool mechanism for this. It's really cool. But the problem with, at least my opinion, is that with mechanism design, is that there are always so many uh, ifs and buts and so on, right? Uh, uh, that uh, you, you don't know whether you're completely satisfied with it, but I think it's a cool. I think it's 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 cool. So I wanted to show it to you, uh, and um, it's 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 um, it's a very simple mechanism. So we want to make sure that evaluations are reported truthfully, and um, you know we assume here that uh, we don't have any access to the ground truth. It turns out if you have access to ground truth, you can use these proper scoring rules and things like this. Which, uh, which are pretty good. But here, you have no way of checking. And why? Because you just have too many graders. You're trying to scale this to lots and lots of people. So you know, if, you, if you had a bunch of people checking everything, you'd defeat the whole purpose of, of the scaling. Um, so you don't have any access to the ground uh, truth. And, and one thing that we were sure about is that we really wanted a simple mechanism. Because what happens with a lot of these mechanisms is that no great, no, nobody's ever going to follow it. You know, like if you've looked at the literature, it'll be like, some of them were like, okay, so you report what you think is right, and then you report what you think all the other guys will, will you know, it's like stuff like that. So uh, we very much wanted a minimal sort of mechanism. Uh, so um, so the, the obvious idea here is that, you know, if you, uh, if, if you want to know if, if somebody did something correctly, you give it to another person and then you check what they're doing, etc. Right? And you try to reward them if people if if, if they agree, right? And um, you sort of hope that they won't lie if you do that. So um, so 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 here's like an example, right? So there's a lot of notation and all this stuff. So I, I just I just wanted to show you show you an example. With some of the notation, and then and then show you the mechanism, and, and that's it. So um, okay, so supposing you know you ask the question, did student I pass or fail the assignment? And assume that there are two kinds of assignments that you're going to receive as a grader. They could be long answers or short answers. Uh, and assume that you know this generative model is, is sort of known that the probability that uh, half the answers are are long and half the answers are short, and this is known and um, and, and, and the stuff in this, uh, this table is known. So the grader assigns a grade of pass or fail. Uh, and in this particular example, if the answer is long, then the probability that the grader will assign it a pass is 0.95. Uh, if the answer is short, then it's 0.5. So sort of long answers, 
So I, I, I grew up in India and like, you know, the idea there was like, just write a lot, you know, and, <laughs> and the creator was like, okay, it's probably all right, I have a lot of papers to grade. And so, um, but anyway, so that, this particular example uh, just illustrates uh, what, the, what the notation is. So, um, so Vonan, who's sort of a pioneer in all of this and who uh, did a bunch of super cool stuff like capture and so on, in his ESP game, he has this thing called an output agreement mechanism where um, you, you give the reward if and only if uh, the answer is match. Now, and the reward is fixed. So, um, in the example that we just, that I just showed you, uh, it turns out that uh, the incentives are a little bit messed up. Because what happens is if you get a long answer and you don't like it, you're gonna think, hmm, the probability that the other guy assigns it uh, a fail is really low, it's like 0 0.05. So I won't get my reward. So maybe I should lie, you know? And, uh, and you can then calculate the uh, probabilities, you know, and it turns out that it's actually profitable to lie, right? So, um, so okay, so what are you gonna do now? So, uh, because it is kind of nice to have a simple mechanism like this. So we came up with, uh, or Vijaya came up with something uh, called square root agreement, where um, the idea is the it's the same sort of thing, you know, like if the answers are different, you don't give them any reward. But if it, if they are uh, the same, then it's the uh, inverse the square root of the probability that the, that the answers would be the same. So in other words, you get a higher reward if the likelihood of agreement is 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 less, so this is sort of trying to uh, combat the case that I was describing earlier, where you got a you got a long answer and you don't like it, but you think, oh, the other guy is gonna you know probably say it's uh, it's uh, it's good, um, and so this this would you know so you in 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 this case it's not obvious that you should lie because. You, Oh, what if the other guy also doesn't like it? Then I get a big reward because the probability that both of us would uh, would mark a long answer uh, fail is 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 low. So uh, so that that's that's it. And then um, uh, it's really easy to to show why it worked. Um, so basically, supposing uh, an agent observes. A little while, right? Some long answer or something, right? Um, then he just calculates his payoffs. So the payoff, you know, if he says why, if he, you know, if he says tells the truth, if he says why, uh, it is just that's just the conditional distribution, of the probability multiplied by the reward. And then if he lies, then that's gonna, you know, that's his expected reward. So you just calculate the two expected rewards, and you just. Uh, you know, you just cross multiply, and um, uh, it, 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 it works out, you know, the, the first line is literally when you just cross multiply, the second one is where you just, you know, what is, what is this probability? It's just that sum, and that's just, uh, that's just Gaussian Schwartz. So, um, so that's it. There's, um, so, so it's, it's better for him, the payoff is, it's always better for an expected payoff to tell the truth, uh, or no worse. So, so the thing about this is that um, it's an in, it, it's not a strict inequality, right? So, so maybe you know he could lie and also do so well, right, and so on. So then, then it, it, this whole thing goes into uh, a lot of um, uh, it becomes. Uh, the arguments become somewhat complicated when you talk of all the other equilibria and so on. But for this simple case of, you know, is this inequality strict? Uh, it turns out it is, it is strict as long as, you know, you, you don't have some sort of degenerate condition in the way these probabilities are assigned. And so, um, so that's fine. So, so this will be a strict Bayes Nash equilibrium. Uh, you have to worry about uh, other. Uh, oh, the, the second thing is that I assumed a bunch of things are known here, and in reality, you know, the principal or the person assigning the rewards may not know, you know, what the generative model is, 
And but then we show that you know okay if you if over time if you if you track everything then then uh, your estimate of those probabilities will converge to the true probability. So you have to show that. And third, you have to show that um, you know there aren't all these other fully all these other equilibria out there that will sabotage your entire scheme. Uh, and and, and um, in these kinds of things, there always is a way to do it. So if everybody knew the scheme and everybody knew what the least likely thing is, they could just say that. Um, but you you want to show that for a big in, a, a, a sufficiently large uh, set of, of 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 cases, uh, there is you know there this this is the optimal thing to do. And so 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 we showed all those things. So it, um, that ends up being the um, the third question. So um, okay, so so what 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 what's next in all this? So um, so I really think that you know people should should use this idea of combining order grading with with peer grading. I think that will really help a lot. It will make things most accurate because uh, currently the trend seems to be to do everything using order grading, and that's um, I don't think that's a very good uh, solution for a lot of problems. Um, and, and, um, uh, and I think that you know, more experiments are, are good. So one thing that we realized, this was very atypical work for all of us, uh, and, and, and doing experiments was, was very helpful. So Amazon Mechanical Turk is pretty cool. Like you can, you can turn out a bunch of stuff. Um, somebody actually started using our stuff. So this the B stands for Wharton, Online, Ordinal, Peer, or something, right? So they, use it. they actually use it, and they're kind enough to give us credit for it. Um, there's a lot of work, you know, that that um, that has occurred after this uh, on on actually not relying on these BTL and Thurston models, which I totally agree with, because I feel like you know they're sort of arbitrary. These are models where the probability that you'll pick I over J. Depends, you know, only on the difference between the two um, between the two things, the W and the W J. And if you think about it, right, a lot of stuff in life is not like that, you know. So W I minus W J may be something, but it may actually matter what W I is, you know. So uh, so so you know, non-parametric. So this Nihar was able to to do some cool work here, where uh, with, with a bunch of other people where uh, he shows non-parametric ways of, of solving these problems. And, and the methods are such that when you look at a case that where BTL is actually the right model, uh, you get really sharp results for that. So it's general, but it specializes really well as well. Um, and then you know, incentive algorithms for heterogeneous users would be useful. Over here, you know, basically, that there's, there's multiple types of of answers, but only one type of of evaluator, and that would be very cool. So um, yeah, so uh, so I wanted to end. I'm glad I have five minutes with um, uh, just the fact that um, Lids is a really cool place because uh, when I when I was um, trying to uh, think about this talk, I, I realized. Does, do do you, any of you record? Are, are you in this? <laughs> so that's me in the middle there. Uh, that's Bob Gallagher, my advisor. Uh, Sanjeev Kulkarni, who I think is the dean of uh, the graduate school at Princeton now. Uh, that sits at, there. It's uh, Rajesh Pankaj, who is now a very senior executive at Qualcomm. I think he runs all of research and everything for Qualcomm. Uh, there are, that's Dave Forney. Um, Marie Gallagher, uh, that's Emre Talatar over there. You guys know Emre, right? So basically my point here is that this is a random picture. A lot of the people in this picture ended up doing like really, really well. And so 30 years from now, the people you're hanging around with uh, may be like super duper big shots. And you get to do all of that and be so successful 
but also be in an environment where you're encouraged to do exactly what you want to do. What, um, at least for a good subset of lids, I hope. Yeah, 20 uh, years is not good enough for students. They want 20, five. five. But definitely <laughs> upper bounded, I mean, by 30. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe, I mean, all these people, it's different, different kind of concepts for, for different people. Uh, but, um, so it's a great place. So enjoy the time that you're here. Don't think too much about a lot of practical things. Just enjoy yourself, it all works out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? So for the mechanism design part, uh, would something like if I'm grading person X, then person X is grading me also be a good way to ensure truth for them? Perhaps, um, yeah, perhaps. The problem with these uh, mechanism design things is that you have to be very precise about what you know your assumptions are and what you mean by uh, optimal mechanism. Um, I actually have a question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the second part of your talk, you talked about different graph topologies, mm. and some some of them are optimal, some of them are non-optimal. But I guess um, one of the optimal things was there. There was a star graph. I know. Yeah, it's surprising. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's kind of counterintuitive because mm. because um, by any chance, if you're the center node, are you thinking about robustness? Uh, yeah. But this doesn't take robustness into account, right? You mean if the thing gets nuked or something? The, what do you mean by robustness with respect to what? Uh, for example, um, if the, the center node is very, very small, so mm -hmm. that the, the comparison, by comparison, you get very little um, information about the ranking of the, all, the, all the other um, things, then... Okay, so, so I think the assumption on this is that you, you try to um, spread the comparisons equally over all the edges. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you know, the, the star will be involved in a lot of comparisons. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I think this wraps up the... Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, let's thank... Um, okay, thank you. Again. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, this wraps up the plenary session, and we'll, we'll have a short coffee break, and we'll be convened at 3.15. And it's a small, small amount of... Um, small piece of announcement that don't forget to vote for the best poster session. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, you want this uh, clicker back? Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Okay.